Mataji, I want to begin by saying that I feel very privileged, yes. very honored to I have too. this uh, opportunity <laughs> yes. uh, to talk with you yes. for about an hour or so. Uh, let me begin by uh, asking uh, why would a professor at a major university uh, which enjoys very high respect throughout India, uh, give up the academic life uh, to become a monastic. What was it that induced you <laughs> to make that change? Well, that is too personal, but still, I can say that it is the call of the divine. Call of the divine. Yes. Well, I'm attracted towards the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. Right. From my student days. Uh, very understandable. So, when the opportunity came, when I met a holy man like Swami Yatishwarananda Ji, that um, desire became really intense. Yes. So there was no other way no but other to way. give up. Right. To Your take regard up. for him was so great that you wanted to follow the path. Yes. That he had. Yes. Followed. Well, I understand that completely, and I'm sure that we all do. Uh, well, turning to less personal matters, <laughs> um, four years ago in Chicago, as you know very well, uh, the second world parliament of religions was convened. And of course, that was a centennial of the first one, a yes. hundred years before. A remarkable event, um, but I wonder, if there would have been a centennial, that is to say, whether that first parliament would be remembered a hundred years later, had it not been for the presence of Swami Vivekananda, who, uh, as the press uh, put it, took that conference by storm, and I think uh, escalated it to worldwide attention. Now that leads into what I'd like to ask you now. Why did Swami Vivekananda come to Chicago? And that opens on to the larger but related question, does Vedanta have a mission for America? Is there something uh, in the spiritual climate of this country, uh, which, what shall I, how shall I put it, lacks an ingredient, a component that the great tradition of India is epitomized in his case in the Vedanta. Uh, what is the contribution or mission of Vedanta to the West? Well, uh, Vedanta is a philosophy of the oldest scriptures of the Hindus called Vedas. Yes. Vedas have two portions. The first is Karma Kanda, the work portion. The second is Jnana Kanda, the knowledge portion or the spiritual portion. Karma Kanda consists only in rituals and ceremonials. Right. That is today it is not in Vogue at all this uh, spiritual portion, they are called as Upanishads. Yes. The Upanishads, they contain the highest philosophy and spirituality of the Vedic thought. 
actually it contains the gist and the quintessence of the Vedic reasoning, Vedic thought you can say. So, because of that and also because they are the end of the Vedas. Yeah. Vedanta means end of the Vedas. So, that is, that is the end, the culmination, the fulfillment of the Vedas. This Vedanta contains the very gist, the essence of this philosophy of the Vedas. Mm -hmm. You see, it is a very ancient philosophy. It comes of such a hoary antiquity, but still Vedanta is a living religion. It is so dynamic because it has been authenticated by a galaxy of great seers, saints and sages down to our own times. For you can see that Sri Krishna, Lord Buddha, Shankara, Ramanuja and many, a host of others, you know, they all actually authenticated, they proved the truth of this Vedas, this Vedanta. Especially in the modern time, it is Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda, you know, who gave a dynamic turn to this Vedanta philosophy through their personal experimentation, you can say, their experience, their exposition, you know. Not only they, uh, they authenticated, but they actually revitalized it, making it united with the scientific findings, the social thoughts of the present day, so that Vedanta can face the challenges of the modern times. Actually, the philosophy of Vedanta is this. Vedanta declares that man is divine, the divinity of man. The Vedas declare, they address the human beings, you know, as children of immortality, amrutasya putraha. So, they de declare that each and every one of us is the inheritors of the highest divinity. Man is not a sinner. He is not a creature of circumstances, but is a spark of the divine. He is, contains this divinity within. Mm -hmm. So, in that way, you know, if I am divine, you are divine, everyone is divine. So, thus, that brings us to this. The second important teaching is the unity mm -hmm. of the entire universe the solidarity of the universe. This has been proved today by the science, isn't it? So, this divinity of man, this solidarity of this universe, this has been proved even by science today. Well, you ask me, how can this philosophy have any use in today, in this modern world? Really, today, the modern man, he stands at a, a momentous crossroads of human history. He knows much more than his ancestors. His skill, his intelligence is enormous. His achievements in science and technology is amazing. His inventions, you know, they are dazzling how he has conquered the nature, how he has actually become the master of this physical world. But man is not happy. He has no peace within or without. He is actually feeling a frustration. He feels so lonely. He feels so improvised in the midst of plenty, in the midst of luxury, in the midst of wealth. He feels so full of tensions. Are these tensions, this restlessness, uh, greater? Do you find them greater in America than in India? Whether India or America, I think in America, because man has conquered the nature, you know, he has become, 
he has acquired so many amenities and all that. He has got everything, but still he lacks the inner peace mm -hmm. that is more perceptible. Why he lacks this peace? What is that he lacks? The thing is, you know, the inner purity, the inner peace, that is what he is lacking. The problem is, he is actually becoming a burden to himself. See, I think 100 years ago, even more than 100 years ago, the German philosopher Schopenhauer, what has he said? He said, all men who are now become free from care, free from want, at last they were thrown out, all the burdens, but now they have become a burden to themselves. So man is a burden to himself. Man is a problem. He is facing a big problem, how to get over it how to attain the highest peace. So Vedanta comes there. Mm -hmm. Because Vedanta is study of man in depth. Mm -hmm. So the science, you know, science and technology on which men depended. Today, where are they? What have they done? Yes, really, when we look outside in the physical world, there is so much of unity. When I, when I look out on the streets and everywhere, there is so much of unity. Man has conquered the nature. You know, computerization is commonplace today. Communications, the network, you know, the network of communication has linked every part of the world. Satellites are global wide today. But if I, yes. if I come back. Uh, once more to my question of why did Vivekananda come to the West? Did he sense a lack in the Christianity and Judaism that were the dominant religions of the West? Or was it certain problems that modernity was proposing that he felt that Vedanta had the answer to? Or maybe it was both of those. Yes, Vedanta has an answer for all this because Vedanta, as Julian Huxley has defined, it is a science of human possibilities. So the inner dormant possibilities are not being actually discovered. Sciences, they have discovered so many things in the physical world, yes. but that is, which is inner world, you know, it has not yet been discovered. So Swami Vivekananda came to the Western world and declared all that the greatest treasure is in you only. You are that great children of immortality. Dive deep and see what you have got inside. Mm -hmm. So he addressed them and that parliament of religion, children of immortality, teach yourself, teach everyone your real nature. Mm -hmm. Call upon the sleeping soul, see how it awakens, mm -hmm. power will come, glory will come, everything that is excellent will come when the sleeping soul is actually awakened. So this soul power should be actually awakened. For that purpose only he had come. Mm -hmm. I think now this preaching of Vedanta, that the spread of Vedanta, the teachings of Vedanta, is helping man to find out the inner peace, the inner solace. So diving deep within himself, you know, the dormant powers. Mm -hmm. Because through science we have come very near to each other, isn't it? So near it has actually brought us, but we have not yet actually known each other. We have not learned to love each other. When we have come so near, not knowing each other, not learning how to love each other, what will happen? A calamity will take place. So at this supremely dangerous moment in history, as Toynbee puts it, you know, first of all we must know how to love each other, how to have sympathy, how to have this broad-mindedness going above our little, little prejudices. That is why Vedanta preaches, you know, the one great teaching of Vedanta is only in a small little formula, that is Tattvamasi. 
Know thyself. Tat tvam asi. This is a small word, but it contains the most significant truth, profound truth. Know thyself. You are not this body which perishes. You are not the mind. You are not the intellect which has got its own limitations. But you are that. You are that Atman, you know. You are deathless. You are birthless. Achedyo, ayamadahyo, akledyo, ashoshyayevacha, nityaha, sarvagataha, sthano achalo ayam sanatana. You are that Atman, deathless, birthless. You are the divine. You unfold yourself. You see what great treasures are actually inherent in you. That is what Vedanta declares. So, Some, in that small word, we can find the greatest truth. Yes. Sometimes that uh, compact formula, Tapramasi, that thou art, uh, seems to me like the spiritual counterpart to the physicist formula E equals MC yes, squared. Yes. Uh, yes, which yes. compacts yes. A, a whole view of yes. nature and yes, the yes. counterpart is what you have brought out. Yes, let that is turn, very correct. Let me turn to another matter. In, in the Western traditions, um, uh, the children of Abraham, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, God is typically envisioned uh, as masculine. Now, in India, uh, am I right in thinking uh, that uh, more uh, prevalent is and customary is the notion of thinking of God uh, in feminine term? Um, you're nodding, so I gather you're validating <laughs> that uh, so far, that yes. perception. Uh, so let me press on from there and ask you, um, does it make any difference to our actual, ongoing, practical, everyday life, which of these uh, gender alternative uh, we use? Uh, I think we probably can agree that in reality, and as uh, his, her, its, or whatever the pronouns never seem to work uh, for uh, God, uh, that uh, this is probably beyond all gender, but uh, we can uh, uh, view that transgender reality in either masculine or feminine guise. And does it make any difference to the uh, ongoing life which one of these is chosen? God is worshipped as mother not only by the Hindus, in all the ancient countries. In all? In all the ancient civilizations. All of the ancient in civilization. Egypt, the divine was worshipped at Isis, goddess, mother goddess was there. Even in Babylonia, Assyria, in Greece, in so many countries, you know, they had this. In India, you know, this divinity as worshipped, there are two um, concepts. One is Agama, they say. Other is Nigama. Agama school looked upon the divine as mother. And Nigama school looked upon the divine as Parabrahman. That is male. Parabrahman. Brahma and this energy, this Shakti. You know what Sri Ramakrishna said? He said, Brahma, Shakti, they are indivisible. Just like fire and its power to burn. Anyhow, this Agama Nigama consists of the entire Indian Hindu philosophy. So, this Agama Shastra, that is the Tantras, Tantras are the Agama Shastra, you know. They consider that she, the mother goddess, she is a creator, she is a nourisher. And she is actually the destroyer of the entire universe. You know, in the practical life, you, your question actually um, points out to what actua actually today, how it affects. The thing is, when we worship the divine as mother, motherhood, 
when we worship her as father masculine so in the society you know the masculine the assertive that tendency prevails assert assertive yes assertive masculine aspect when when you worship the mother goddess motherhood stands for what for integrity for love for compassion because you know mother she had this she is the one integrating principle in the family in the family what happens the children feel more near to the mother because mother brings out the children you all know that that uh, prenatal influences on the children what mother thinks what mother eats what actually mother feels you know that helps for the growth of the child so the child is very near to the mother so the relation between the child and the mother is so spontaneous it is so near so child depends on the mother actually it was it is the mother you know who helps a lot for the development of the character of course i am not minimizing the part of the father yeah. father protects i understand that father chides yeah. father is there to guide him in everything but mother is nearer mother yeah. is the nearest so this mother has got the uh, proper capacity you know to integrate the family it is not that she wants each and every member of the family to lose all their individuality and all that keeping their individuality keeping that perfect you know through her love through her integrity she makes them she brings about a togetherness yeah. a unity in the family yeah. a union in the family so today in the modern world you know this predominance of this masculine aspect is becoming too much too much that that is why this worship of mother this rever- reverence for the motherhood is emphasized most yeah. one swami ji said in this age you know mother worship should be preached because mother stands for energy mother is shakti swarupini she is the personification of energy and power so the more we go near motherhood what happens even in the family you know when you worship divine as mother our body consciousness especially the sense of sex these things you know it it is lessened and actually the bonds of the domestic peace the bonds of the family the domestic happiness domestic peace that is increased when in the west woman is respected only as a wife she is not venerated as a mother so naturally but i am just telling you because in india mother is given the first place yeah. mother is the highest when a woman is always addressed as ma in anywhere in the trams in the buses and everything a girl a woman is always addressed as ma but here in the west you cannot address a lady as mother she may feel hurt <laughs> so the thing is this motherhood is very much respected Absolutely. in hindu society here it is not so much venerated a wife may help through her loving service and all that to bring a very dominant husband she can help him to have some more a softness and all that but a mother has that has got that integrating capacity you know through her selflessness through her love today you know the integrating process of this mother ideal in the social dynamics is very much emphasized in the western countries in the eastern countries alike because you know we are actually men and women caste and classes and the nations and communities we are all coming together together we are drawn together through this cultural scientific technological economical forces you know humanity as if it is going undergoing a, a reconstruction integration so what is very much needed today you know the force of love which force can generate this love it is a mother idea that's a very very interesting distinction not just interesting but important that in the west 
the tendency is in the family constellation to think of the uh, woman as wife, whereas in India to think of her as mother. I recall once when my wife uh, and I were taking students around the world uh. and uh, the Indian representative of our program, yeah. uh, the, uh, the students were very impressed that he never referred to his wife except as Mataji, as revered mother. Yeah. And for Western students to see an Indian householder refer to what in the West, as you say, would have been wife, yes. as revered mother impressed our students uh, yes. very greatly. Let me come to this matter of the world being drawn into a unity. And in uh, certain respects, that is very uh, obvious. Television is everywhere, and yes. fax, and yes, email, yes, and yes. so on. So those forces are very real. And yet, along with that tendency, there is so much factionalism going on. Ethnic conflict, uh, the last report I heard, 67 ethnic conflicts, which are yes. at the proportions of violence going on. Violence going now, on. how do you balance and integrate, is that possible, these two uh, simultaneous uh, processes which seem to be contradictory in many respects. The thing is, you know, the aspect of love, the aspect of integration, that many people should come forward, many people should take up this ideal. So the majority people are following the opposite direction. So only few are taking up to this highest ideal because in that highest ideal, how many travelers will be there? Very few and far between. So if this concept of love, concept of integration, if it is actually nurtured, it is given more importance through television, through media, everywhere. I think through the television, what I see in India, these uh, films, the whole day, the students, the children, they watch. What is there? Only the crime and this, that and everything. So it is instigating them. So we must change the whole process. We must try to change. This uh, will not be so easy. But I think if we attempt, if we take a real attempt, instead of just uh, lectures and hearing, it should not end there. But real something should be done towards that. I, I think everyone, I can't think of anyone who would di disagree that something should, should be, be done. Taken. Will it be done? That's another way of asking, yes. are you hopeful for the world? I know you're hopeful for the inner spirit because yes. it is divine and cannot be crushed. But are you hopeful for the world? No, unreal will never triumph. Truth will triumph. So one day... Truth will... Uh, triumph. Will so love triumph. will conquer, not hatred. Yes. Yeah. Sure. In referring to the world, I know that uh, in India, in the Vedanta, uh, it is referred to as maya. Yeah. And what is the meaning of maya? Often it is translated as illusion. Is illusion. that a correct translation? And in what it feels very real. <laughs> uh, what, what is the Indian concept of maya? No, in the Advaita philosophy, they say maya doesn't exist. It appears to be like that. It is not true. They give the famous example, you know, that a small piece of rope was lying there and it was dark. Everybody took it for a snake and people were shouting and then somebody brought a big stick and everything, but when you went near, 
it was not a snake but only a rope. So like that, you know, this, um, I was telling about the mother goddess, this Agama, this Tantras, the Tantra scripture says, this mother, mother goddess, she has this capacity to delude. It is only when she, out of compassion, when she removes the veil, she has put on that veil, you know, that veil of ignorance. When she removes the ignorance, well, the enlightenment comes. So you can understand, it is only a rope, not a snake. It doesn't actually exist. It exists, Sri Shankaracharya has said, it exists, it doesn't exist. You mm -hmm. cannot say, it doesn't exist at all because I'm seeing it as a snake and all the fear, my heart is throbbing and so many things happened. But when you go very near to the truth, the ignorance is removed. So you are face to face with the truth. Yes. So you must um, pray to the mother. Remove the veil of ignorance. We remove the veil of Maya. Maya is a factor because we see the world. We take it as so real. That is Maya. It is not real. It appears to be real. Appearance. Yeah. This appearance, you know. Appear, appears this to be. This apparent reality is the Maya. You it said appears. That, you said that uh, when one sees that the rope is not a snake but a rope, uh, then you are enlightened. Yes. And uh, a journal has come out. I just uh, came across it. Someone sent me a copy. It's quite new, but uh, it comes out four times a year. And the name of the journal is What is Enlightenment? That's the whole point of the journal, to keep on discussing year after year, issue after issue. What is enlightenment? Yeah. What is Enlightenment, yes. enlightenment is to know thyself, your real, your real swarupa, your real nature. Right. You are that. And the whole universe is pervaded by that only one reality. And you are one with it. When Lord Buddha, when he saw all the miseries of the world, you know, he went and he did so much of tapasya and all that. For six years, you know, he followed all the austerities. Then, well, he realized. He became Buddha, the enlightened one. So he know the reality. What is the real thing? Yes, the suffering is there. And there is also the means to remove the suffering. So you know your real nature. You know that highest knowledge about you and the universe. That is enlightenment, when you know that you are not this body which perishes. You are not this body, you are that real Atman, you are one with that Sat, Chit, Ananda, Swarupa. You are that existence, you are that knowledge, you are that bliss. So knowing that and becoming one with that. When you become with that, you know, you are not going to talk at all. You are that. You are established in that. What is enlightenment, you know? It is beyond words to explain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I hear that. One who has enlightened can only say and one. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I hear that, but uh, we're asked to continue our conversation and not to lapse into silence. So let me ask this. Uh, it seems clear that there is a distinction between understanding with one's mind that all is one, or as the Lord Buddha, whom you referred to, uh, is said on emerging from his experience, wonder of wonder, all things are intrinsically the Buddha nature. Now, I can very uh, readily agree to that, and as you say, science too is uh, pointing in this direction. Yes. But there, I find a great difference between understanding that point with my intellect and understanding it with my emotions and my responses so that I would be able to respond to every event that comes my way and every person and every problem and so on as underneath this Maya veil, 
the Buddha nature. Buddha now that nature. difference between uh, intellectually saying, yes, that's true, and yet being able to incorporate it in one's responses and really feel that way. Uh, there is a difference, is that yes, right? There is a difference. All right. Now, this leads into, is it possible uh, while one, well, I'll, I'll come to the Sanskrit word, a uh, jiva mukta, we have her, uh, the teaching is that a jiva mukta, a jiva is the spirit and mukta is liberation, a completely limer liberated spirit within a human body. Yes. Is that possible? Yes, of course. <laughs> I love the way, uh, sure, a matter of fact, it's obvious. <laughs> Uh, yes. Because I guess I feel the weight of these mortal coils yes. uh, uh, so heavily that it, uh, I can envision human beings progressing towards that, uh, what as they used to say about ivory soap, 99 and 44 percent pure, uh, <laughs> getting to that point but I guess uh, my optimism or my exuberance sort of fails me uh, to that last 56.56%. Uh, uh, but you say, uh, yes, that it is evident, uh, uh, take it as evident. Have you met a Jiva Mukta? Yeah, have you been in personal contact? Personal contact means I have seen, I have heard from them. You have heard from them. Yes, I have heard about, I don't know whether you are familiar with that name, Swami Brahmananda. Oh, my own teacher was uh, his teacher, Swami yes, yes. He was a direct Nanda disciple, of, disciple of Brahman. You know Swami uh, Vivekananda. I will leave Ramakrishna, Vivekananda and Holy Mother. But coming next, Swami Brahmananda. I mean, the whole of his life history, you know, who has seen him as narrated to us, how he lived. You too must have heard from your guru. How he lived, he was a Jivan Mukta. Because whenever we think about, we meditate about his life, you know, especially the last days when he passed away, how he remembered, yes, yes, from where he has come, and he is going to the same thing. It's the reminiscences of so many people, you know, they are so near to us. They are so near to us. So we can see that they lived with us. At the same time, they were in that high plane. I can tell you another instance, you know, whom I have seen. That is the first president of Sri Sharada Mat. Her name is Prabhrajika Bharati Prana. She is the direct disciple of Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi. We lived with her. And I have seen her in her last day when he passed away. I mean, I can say that, yes. Yes. I have witnessed a Jeevan Mukta. Well, I like that answer. Yes. That's a uh, good thing. Yes. Very good thing. Yes. Because how she passed away, you know, the last moment she was telling Satchidananda Shivoham, Satchidananda Shivoham, Satchidananda Shivoham. And we... we you, were, you'll need to translate. Uh, yes, that trumps that me. Sat, I can't uh, follow sat, that. Chit Ananda means, Sat means existence, Chit means knowledge, Ananda means bliss. Oh, yes. So, I am that Satchidananda Shivoham. I am. The, I am that. I am yeah, that. Good. We who were actually witnessing the last day with her, you know, the last moment, we are all, how many it is about, in seven, in, I am talking about 20 years ago, 22, 23 years ago, 1972, I think. Right. We all felt, you know, something big, something divine, something vast. It is a drop of water mingling with the ocean. You felt the presence of something Bhuma, you can say, mm -hmm. something Virat, you can say. So, that indicates the life what she led, isn't it? 
we were talking about Sri Ramakrishna, we were reciting what happens when a, a sadhu, when a monk passes away. We take the name of God, uh, Hari Om, Sri Ramakrishna, like that we utter. But she who was suffering for some days, you know, she, her voice became so strong above all our voice, you know. She began to utter, Satchidananda Shivoham, Satchidananda Shivoham. Till the last moment, you know, I was watching her mouth. Yeah. Satchidananda Shivoham. It became slow, slower, slower, and finally it stopped. And we felt the bliss of it. We were one with it. Mm -hmm. She became very... one with the divine. Yeah. That I experienced, so I can say. Yeah, yes, I have seen a jiva. Very wonderful uh, witness. That is an experience, you know. Yes. After so many years, even today, I can never forget. Let me ask you: um, We all encounter people. I certainly do, who uh, find themselves blocked from a spiritual outlook because of the stumbling block of evil. That is, they say, if as these wisdom traditions, the world's religions say, that everything has issued from a perfect being, how can we reconcile that with so much pain and suffering and outright evil deeds and so on in the world. How, would, how do you answer them? I, or maybe in India where you don't encounter no, people an, with this problem. No, that is an eternal question. The question is there, why there is so much of suffering? Yes. As Lord Buddha, why there is so much of suffering? So he went to find out the cause for good, it. Good, good. So he brought uh, the solution for it. He said, Ashahi Sarva Dukkhanam Mulaha means because you desire. desire. Desire is the root cause of all these sufferings and everything. That is what Lord Buddha declared, you know. Evil, you know, there is Vedanta believes in only one reality. Yeah. There are no two realities, you know. One is evil, one is good, it cannot be. Vedanta says, man is traveling from lesser truth to higher truth. What we think evil, what we think suffering, it is nothing but the absence of the divine bliss there. It may be lit very little less. So the thing is, we must see, we must develop our correct perspective, you know. So sometimes this suffering, these blows, these things, the despair, the calamities may take us, may lead us towards something good. So if we know that everything, there is one great master who is a creator, who is a father, who is a mother, who is everything of this universe. If you have faith in him, you know, then it is all his doing, he is doing for our good only. So let us accept in that way. Evil is there, suffering is there. Well, let me take it in that attitude, it is for my good. I must undergo, I must, how to pass on, how to go beyond that. So evil, good and everything, these are all the dualities, you know. One must rise above it. Then only we can understand the value of evil, the value of good, the value of suffering, the value of joys. Because we are still in this world of dualities, you know. For us, we see all these things. A time will come, we rise above all these things. Then we can view, I know it is very difficult. These are all, I mean, just uh, talking. Right. But a time will come, a sadhaka who practices, who has immense faith in the God, in the Lord, in the Divine. So we know that whatever he does, it is for the good of us. So in that way we take it, you know, then life became a smoother, it will be helpful to us. We, we cannot change the world, isn't it? We can change only ourselves. We cannot change the world. So the world is full of torrents. The world is full of dirt. So instead of changing the whole world, let us wear a pair of shoes and we can walk. 
So we can avoid it. So in that way, if we can make our life, if we can change our attitude, then I think it will help us. So uh, since there is no duality ah. and the only reality is perfect, evil in the final analysis does not exist, no. is not real. No. But it's currently not real. we have no view of the whole as long as we're caught in yes. the net of Maya. Yes. But if we uh, free ourselves from that net yes. so and rise to a view of yes. a whole, we will see that what we experience now is very Correct. painful, has its place in the entire scheme of things. Is yes. that correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. You, you, as soon as you entered, you said, Asatoma Sadgamaya. Yeah. So let Jesus. us, he must lead us from evil to good. Yes. No, let us not see the evil, feel it, and gradually we will, he will lead us to the higher consciousness. Yes. Uh, why don't uh, you add those next two phrases? Yes. Asatoma sadgamaya, tamasoma jyotir gamaya, mrityorma amritam gamaya. Wonderful. Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. light. Lead us from death, death to, to immortal. immortal life. That's wonderful, wonderful phrase. As a teacher on the campus today in the United States, I find that um, spirituality is a good word for my students, but religion is uh, more ambiguous. Uh, I have yet to uh, encounter a student who does not believe that he or she has a spiritual dimension to his or her life. But uh, when it comes to religion, why the dominant uh, view on the campus is uh, religion because of divisiveness and all the sins that are uh, attendant there too, and, uh, is not a good word. What is the difference between spirituality and religion? Spirituality is one. All the religions speak of spirituality only. Right. This religion, you know, there are so many different communities having different religions. Each right. religion has got its own rituals, its own ceremonies, its own philosophy, right. its own um, rules and regulations and all that. Is that unfortunate <laughs> that they differ? Yes. No, th not that. They but in the beginning, you know, the differences will be there. But if you view it from the higher point of view, from the higher point of view, there is only one religion. These religions, you know, in the beginning, when we are in the kindergarten, we must follow certain rules and regulations. When I first start to write A, B, C and all that, I need so many instruments for me. So I must follow certain rules and regulations. But once I rise higher, you know, then these things fall away. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, you know, Vedanta, actually it recognizes this variety. Variety will be there for this preliminary stage. In the preliminary stages, you know, you need, you belong to one group. You follow certain rules and regulations, then you will go beyond that. Mm -hmm. So Swami Vivekananda used to say, it is good to be born in a church, but not good to die in the church. You must actually go beyond that, beyond the rules and regulations. You will be one in spirituality. Spirit is in each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. There we are all one. Mm -hmm. So these rules and regulations, these distinctions, you know, variety is good in the beginning. We need because each and every one of us, you know, I may like the path of bhakti. I may like the cult of Krishna. Somebody else may like the cult of Shiva. Somebody else may like the cult of Jesus, Allah. So, so many names, names are different, but they all indicate only one reality. In that way, you know, paths are different, but the goal is the same thing. Spirituality is the goal, 
the religions they take us nearer and nearer nearer to it let us not be confined with the rules ritual ceremonies and the religions only you know we will when we learn when we begin when we start we will have those uh, things you know help helps we need those help you know but gradually gradually we give up them we go faster and faster and reach the highest goal then only spirituality remains is vedanta spirituality or a religion vedanta is both religion both. and spirituality <laughs> <laughs> is both um, all right uh, the uh, metaphor which is really now belongs to the world but i be as far as i know it came from Sri Ramakrishna, and you correct me if it has another story, uh, but it has captured, I think, the imagination of the world of religions as many paths towards the same summit of the mountain. And that would uh, conform to what you were saying about at the bottom, yes. at the beginning, why there are differences, but the further one comes along, the differences will recede. Uh, and you're saying that Vedanta is both the summit of the mountain, but it is also, also a path. A path. Uh, are, are the paths of, I know that uh, in the four yogas, the way to go uh, through knowledge or through service and dev uh, devotion and love, through service and through meditation, that those are regarded pretty much as equal, right? Or one is not better, it just happens to be which type, yeah. spiritual type, the practitioner is. But when we come to these paths up the mountain, uh, does Vedanta view them as equal? Equal, of course. It only aptitude of the man, aptitude of the human beings. I am more emotional. For me, bhakti yoga suits me best. If I am a rational person, I do not like the singing and then emotional, uh, these uh, prayers and all that. I want to meditate on the divine, supreme yeah. divine as effulgence. I, am a, I should follow Jnana Yoga. Yeah. And I am a very active type of a man. Right. So I would like to take up this Karma Yoga. I want to do something. Right. I want to be on my work, you know, doing yeah. something. That only gives me satisfaction. Yeah. So just to use all my aptitudes, make the human being, he can use all his capacities. And thus he must reach that. Now, so that is why Swami Vivekananda defined, you know, uh, that uh, this uh, every, uh, this uh, jiva is divine. Yeah. Uh, it is divine. So you take up any path. Yeah. But you must reach there, whatever may be the path. Now, I'm uh, clear, I think uh, the teaching is very clear, that when it comes to these four yogas yes. as uh, paths towards Path. the same summit, that there is no privileging of karma as better no, than no, bhakti no, no. and so on. But uh, what about when we think about these paths as different religious traditions like Christianity or Buddhism or Vedanta and so on. Uh, does Vedanta say that all of those great enduring religions are equal in value and in the uh, grasp of truth that yes. they present? Yes. Vedanta recognizes each and every religion as great as one of the real path. If my religion is true, your religion is also true. Every religion is true. Right. Every religion is a path to reach him only. Yes. Um, all right, I think that is a clear answer. There is no privileging of no Vedanta privilege. over any of no, the never, others. never Vedanta said. Yes, good. Uh, let me uh, change to another subject. Um, the, the, we live in a very scientific age, and in modernity and in the West, why I think probably more people look to science to tell them the truth about the world 
uh, then perhaps they look to their sacred scriptures. Uh, what is your uh, sense of that? Have we, um, is there a tension between science and religion? Modern, you can say one thing, a group, a group of people are there, they are modern because they are using all the modern amenities. For that they are modern. The real modern means a person who has got the inquisitiveness. He wants to know the truth. He wants to seek the truth, to know the truth. In that way there is no uh, tension between science or religion. Religion also wants to know the truth. Science also wants to know the truth. Both they go in the same way. So science and religion, they are only different paths to reach the highest truth. But now science, where it has failed, because it has given so much importance only to intellect, not to the intuitive knowledge of man. Yeah. So science has gone to certain extent, you know, after that, it is not able to find out the real nature of man. So, so it there has, comes. has limitations yes, yes. built in. A lopsided so. development giving all importance to intellect, yes. all importance to brain. Right. The heart is also should be taken up. Yes. So intuitive knowledge also should be taken up. So there, science is not giving the full satisfaction. Otherwise, both are seekers of truth. So. I, the, I can understand that, that the truth is one and science and religion yes. might be two windows yes. from different times. Yes. But sometimes there are great, uh, what seem like uh, they're saying very different things. Take the question of evolution, for example, uh, as you've brought out why uh, in the divinity of the human self that comes from our origins. So, the religions say, we might say, that we human beings are the less who have derived and come from what is greater from us. But we hear from science that we got here by way of evolution and the survival of the fittest and natural selection, which shows us as the more that has derived from the less. Life, we're told by the scientists, began with amoebas or whatever the simplest form is, and has culminated in human beings and intelligence. Now, uh, this sounds like they're saying quite different, maybe opposite thing, are they? No, in the physical sense of the term, it may be the amoeba became expanded and expanded and finally it has come as man or something like yeah. that. But the divinity, the divinity is manifest in the amoeba. The divinity is manifest everywhere because uh, Hindu scriptures declare he was one. He wanted to become many. Yes. He was all alone. Yes. And then he manifested himself as many. He may be an amoeba, he may be a monkey, he may be many, many things, isn't it? But he is there in amoeba, he is there everywhere, his manifestations. Well, I, I uh, uh, believe that with my whole heart, uh, but my problem is that that is not taught well, scientifically in our you want. <laughs> Pardon? Scientifically, you want to say that amoeba expanded, isn't it? Yeah, well, they omit the crucial point that you bring in, that even in the amoeba is the divine or the spirit, but that is not taught in our schools. The Why? A Hindu scripture says he is anoraniyan, he is mahato mohiyan, he is in the atom, also he is in the highest. Right. Even well, the anu, anu, you know, atom, a small, tiny little atom, he only manifests. Yeah. Without him, how can the universe came into existence? Yeah, well, you know, I believe uh, the Vedanta, I believe that that is the truth, but, and perhaps this is uh, uh, off the path, because uh, there is uh, no reason that I should be 
uh, quizzing you about some of the problems no, no, of our no, Western no, society. But of course, the problem is no, no, in it the may be my limitation of the uh, scientific correct knowledge also. No. What I know, that is all I'm just telling. It may be my ignorance. <laughs> no, you're, you're too modest on that. Uh, but the point is, uh, in the West today, we have uh, ourselves in the bind of the separation of church and state, so public money cannot go to teaching about the divine. And so uh, uh, I don't know how it is in India. I assume it's very different, uh, very different. Very different. Uh, but as I say, this is our problem here in the West and how we, uh, we have a, a real job on our uh, hands. We to believe in the Srishti Tattva, means the theory of creation, you know. We believe in this that in the very beginning, Rig Veda says, in the very beginning there was no creation. He alone existed. Yeah. It was neither manifested not unmanifested. What it was, nobody can say. That's uh, one of the most famous yes. hymns yes, hymn. in the Nasadiya, Rig Veda. Nasadiya Sutta. Yeah, the, the hymn Rig Veda. to creation. Yes, in the, Beautiful. Yes, in that creation. Yeah. So it is neither manifested, you can say, nor unmanifested. Well, he wanted to become many. He manifested himself. Well, from where he started, your scientist can say, he started from there, it may be, or he started from the highest, even that we do not know. So the creation theory according to the Hindu scripture is, he alone was there and he became many. Yes. Yeah. That is what we believe. Right. What is um, the place of spiritual training, spiritual discipline uh, in human life? Even as I ask that, I think I hear the answer bubbling up in me. Uh, but why don't you, I'm, I'm sure you're going to say, and I believe this is absolutely, it is fundamental. But yes. can you go beyond that to say, what does the sadhana, the practice, the discipline do for our actual lives in the world? It is one of the most essential things. Yeah. From the childhood, you know, we must instill it little by little. You are the spirit, not just the body. That consciousness, you know, awareness should be given from the very beginning. You are there, you are here, you are everywhere. All your neighbors are your own people. Like that, like that, expansion. Yeah. Expansion, you know. Not the selfishness. What happens nowadays in the modern society? They think of their own, but they do not think of their neighbors, of their country, of the entire universe. We talk of the global uh, values, global unity, these things. But actually, how much we practice? Actually, how much we actually give some of our thoughts for that. So, if it is instilled from our childhood, they can feel the spiritual sadhanas, mm -hmm. little by little at least. Yes. But which form it takes, uh, you've already gone through the four yogas, the four spiritual types, so it uh, the form in which the sadhan uh, will be cast will differ significantly for different people. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, Brahman or God is beyond form. Beyond form. But we envision Brahman, most people, in terms of form, with some form. Is that a concession to the limitation of the human mind? That is to say, the mind, uh, most people, very low on the mountains, as most people we yes. are, yes. uh, need these forms because 
if it has no form m for many people, why it's just nothing. And so uh, 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 speak to us about the place of form in our approach to what is ultimately beyond it. I remember the prayer, O thou before whom all words recoil. Yes. Now words are formed yes. and they're turned back because yes. the reality is yes. above it. Yes. But, it. Uh, but uh, tell us, what is the plate of forms within our approach to the formless? That is in the beginning we need, we need name and form as a support to proceed on. Because in the beginning, the first stages, as you yourself said, in the preliminary stage, you know, we need a forum yeah. as a support. We need a name as a support. But a time will come when everything merges in silence. Yes. Then no forum, no name, no utterance is needed. Because you are in the presence. You become one with it. One with it. Where are two? Only one. You know thyself, you are going, entering your own self. Then there is nothing is needed. I, I have heard, but verify or correct me on this, that there is an actual place in India uh, and it's revered uh, by the Vedantists and maybe other traditions too, where at the most advanced stage of spiritual training, why uh, the, the monk or maybe the nun also, I do not know, uh, is um, assigned by the guru to go to this mountaintop, but at that stage must take no uh, religious supports, no beads, no bells, no incense, no altars, because uh, this is to practice going beyond all of those forms. Uh, am I right in understanding that there is, have you heard, is there such a place in India? Yes. There is. Ramakrishna Martina, it has established in Advaita Ashrama in Mayavati in the Himalayas. Right. There is no puja. No, no incense, yeah. no shrine room, nothing. You make only Advaita sadhana there. Right. Nothing is there. Nothing. Nothing. That's it very It is about 8,000 8, feet. Yes, very, it is. Very, very good. And yet even Shankara wrote uh, hymns of praise yes. to, was it Shiva? Yes. Yeah. There again, the other side of it, recognizing the forms have their place. Yes. And yet uh, need Above. to be trans. Yes, beyond that. Uh, it reminds me, a month ago, I was at a conference in Southern California, and um, at lunch between sessions, uh, four or five of us attending the conference were there, and we were talking about the relation between religion, and beside me was a young Jesuit, a Catholic uh, member of a Catholic order. Wow. And at one point in the discussion, he exclaimed with great fervor, he said, thank God for Advaita Vedanta. Mm -hmm. You know, I, wow. I, I, I never expected in my lifetime to hear a Catholic uh, Jesuit priest uh, come out with such a fervent expression. And I knew immediately by virtue of what our conversation has been about because uh, the, uh, the technical term for God without form and so on, the approach is apophatic in the Greek as over in against cataphatic. And that tradition has been in the West, but it has been submerged. Uh. And so that even he came to it by way of Advaita Vedanta. 
and finding the truth in Veda alerted him to search in his own uh, tradition. And uh, he found, yes, it is there too. But it's one of those inspiring cases where uh, one senses a direct contribution yes. from another. Direct contact, you know, it gives joy. Yes. Immediately they exclaim. Uh, this is maybe very curious. It just popped into my head, and I'll say it anyway. Do you have any questions, or have they all been answered? <laughs> At present, I don't have any questions. <laughs> I feel uh, embarrassingly almost in the same position uh, because you have I'm really done, happy done so, uh, answered my question in such a satisfying, fulfilling way that I feel like I have no questions either. And let me say again, not just an honor, but a great darshan. I'm uh, also very happy. This, uh, I'm honored by talking. Thank you.